on the next two decades of Roman history. As we move into the 90s BC, we've seen various cracks appearing in the structure of the Roman Republic. But at least on the surface, it still seems successful and reasonably solid. Soon, however, the Roman state would be riven by a vicious civil war between the Romans and their oldest allies, and the long-standing rivalries among Roman politicians would explode, with the two dominant men of the era, Marius and Sulla, both feeling justified in marching on Rome at the head of their troops. During most of the 90s BC, with Marius temporarily removed from the scene in a self-imposed exile in the east, the Senate and the Optimates controlled affairs. They had thwarted earlier reform attempts, such as those of the Gracchi brothers, and they now adopted a hard line against change, refusing to award Marius' veterans with land, shifting power in the courts in their favor, and minimizing the role of equestrians, and squashing any initiatives to grant citizenship to the Italians. As a result, the resentments of the veterans, the poor, the equestrians, the lower classes, and the Italians continued to fester. In 91 BC, yet another tribune, Marcus Livius Drusus, came forward with a slate of proposals for laws that would address some of the still unresolved problems. Interestingly, Drusus was not a representative of the Populares, but instead of the Optimates. He seems to have adopted a moderate stance, believing that some change was necessary to avoid chaos. He thought it would be smarter for the Optimates to offer some compromises rather than risk losing their grip on power entirely. His three main proposals were to give land to veterans and the poor through the establishment of new colonies, to admit 300 equestrians to the Senate, doubling its size, and drawing juries from this larger pool, and finally to extend citizenship to all Italians south of the Po River. This was one of those compromises that gave more than some groups had wanted to concede, but offered less than others had hoped for. Thus, it fully pleased no one. Still, it seemed as if the first two proposals would be passed by both Senate and people, although opinion was still bitterly divided on the citizenship issue. Just as with the Gracchi, there is uncertainty about the degree to which Drusus's actions were motivated by altruistic concern for his country, and how much he was driven by seeking to enhance his reputation and attract supporters. Certainly, if he were the man responsible for granting citizenship to the Italians, he would ingratiate himself with a huge body of citizens. An interesting text survives purporting to be an oath that the Italians swore to Drusus, containing an explicit statement of loyalty to him. It reads in part, I swear by Capitoline Jupiter and Vesta of the Romans, by Mars the ancestral god, and by the sun and the earth, by the demigods who founded Rome, and by the heroes who extended Rome's dominion, that I will have the same friends and enemies as Drusus and that I will spare neither my life, nor that of my children, nor my parents, unless it should help Drusus, and those who swear this oath. If I become a citizen by the law of Drusus, I will embrace Rome as my homeland, and regard Drusus as the greatest benefactor. What might have happened had Drusus's legislation passed, and he gained the gratitude of all the Italians? Is unknown, because before the vote could take place, Drusus died under mysterious circumstances, most likely stabbed by an assassin. The death of Drusus and his legislation was the last straw for the long-suffering Italian allies. Too many times they had had the prize of citizenship dangled before them, only to have it repeatedly denied. Fed up, with the Romans' intransigence, 
many of them now broke into open rebellion against Rome. A confederacy of Italian cities was established with the core of the rebel territory lying along the Adriatic coast of Italy. Many of the Marcians, Samnites, and Lucanians of central and southern Italy joined, but with the exception of one city, all the Latins who had preferential status remained loyal to Rome. The resulting conflict became known as the Social War, because the Latin term for allies was socii. The Confederacy of Italian Allies modeled itself after the Roman state. They set up a Senate-like assembly composed of 500 members, and they established a capital city which they named Italia. In a nice bit of visual propaganda, the Italians issued coins depicting on one side a personification of Italia, and on the other a dramatic image of a bull representing the Italians violently trampling upon and goring a wolf, the animal symbolic of Rome. The social war was a particularly bitter war, since it was in essence a civil war. Both sides were using the same tactics and equipment, and it pitted against one another men who for centuries had fought together. Rome had the advantage in having more total troops as well as an experienced body of officers to call upon. Among these was Lucius Cornelius Sulla, who enhanced his reputation by ably leading armies against the rebels in central Italy. In 90 BC, in an effort to quell the revolt and prevent it from spreading, the Romans proclaimed that full citizenship would be granted to all Latins and Italians who had remained loyal and further stated that any rebels who immediately ceased hostilities and renewed allegiance to Rome would also be awarded full citizenship. This had some effect, and although the war continued, similar laws were passed in each of the two subsequent years, eroding support for the rebellion. The Italians achieved some early successes, but as the weight of Rome's resources came to bear upon them, the tide turned in Rome's favor. Nevertheless, the war dragged on until 88 BC, when Roman armies finally crushed the most intransigent of the insurgents. While technically, in a military sense, Rome was victorious in the social war, the main result of the conflict was that the Romans were compelled to at last bestow full citizenship on all free persons on the Italian peninsula. The social war is therefore a rather tragic example of Roman conservatism and resistance to change, since in the end, the Romans had to grant the Allies what they had wanted in the first place. The war brought considerable death and devastation to central Italy, produced hordes of refugees and burdensome debts, and set a very harmful precedent for civil war being used to solve political disagreements, all of which should have been easily avoidable if the Romans had only done the obvious and justified thing by extending citizenship to the Italians much earlier. On the positive side, the ranks of Rome's citizens were now increased by at least half a million, and all of Italy became fully Romanized and integrated into Roman culture. As the war was winding down, Sulla, who was clearly on the ascendant, was elected consul for the year 88 BC. Sulla has an interesting background. He was a member of one of the oldest patrician families in Rome, and his ancestors had reached the highest levels of Roman government. More recently, however, his family's fortunes had sharply declined so much so that in his youth, Sulla had to rent a cheap apartment, living on the floor beneath a former slave. At least according to the account of his life recorded by the ancient biographer Plutarch, Sulla spent his youth in a dissolute fashion, drinking, having affairs, and associating with people regarded as disreputable, such as dancers and comic actors. Nevertheless, 
he also seems to have harbored a fierce determination to restore the fame and wealth of his family. He had enough talent to earn himself a place on Marius's staff, where he arranged the capture of Jugurtha. Jealousy over who should get the credit for this coup was the cause of his then falling out with Marius and the beginning of what would prove to be a long-standing rivalry between the two men. You might expect that the two men could just get over arguing about Jugurtha, but several incidents kept the quarrel fresh. For example, over a decade after Jugurtha had been captured, a friend of Sulla's erected a statue at Rome depicting Jugurtha surrendering to him. This enraged Marius and might have led to open violence. But just then, the social war broke out and the men had bigger things to worry about. Once the war concluded, their positions had dramatically changed, with Marius in disgrace and Sulla having risen to the consulship. Marius still had the greater reputation as a general, so the next thing that Sulla aspired to was a chance to enhance his own military laurels. Conveniently for Sulla, just as the social war was winding down, a new external foe had emerged in King Mithridates VI of Pontus. That's a realm uh, located near the Black Sea. Mithridates had recently gained the throne by imprisoning and possibly murdering his own mother and brother, and he was a dynamic and able monarch with aspirations of carving out an empire and becoming a second Alexander the Great. While many rulers had the same dream, Mithridates actually had 